I got to get my visual aid, my illustration here. Who's hiding? Come on, buddy. Let's let's do something. Do some flips or something. And I so I, so I googled fish stores and I found Aqua Imagination. And I said, I've never been there before. It's right there on Bogan Road and Buford Drive, right by the Toyota Mall of Georgia, Karen, right there. And um, as uh, I went into the store, never been there before, and Mike's there. He's busy working, cleaning tanks and messing around, doing different things, organizing. And we just started talking and hanging out a little bit. And I said, I need, I, I called it an os- Osceolus. And he said, you mean an Ocellaris? That's, that's what one of those is, an Ocellaris. And, and I said, yeah, that's what I need. And he said, okay, well, and I'll be honest with you, this isn't a Nemo, but it's very close. What's the name of this fish? Clarky clownfish. A Clarky clownfish. This isn't the, the actual Ocellaris, the, the Nemo, but it's pretty close. And you, well, you can't see anything, so you don't know, do you? Can you see him in there at all? Yeah, he's, he's kind of, sh- he's moving around a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Oh, there we go. I told Jason that he'd have a perfect seat if he just stayed up here, but you didn't want him. <laughs> anyway, so Mike, I, I was talking to him a little bit, and, and last night I thought, well, shoot, it would be perfect. I could just text him and say, hey, why don't you come to church and bring the fish with you? And he's like, okay. <laughs> and so he's here this morning. Yeah. So, so if you're interested in fish or getting interested in them, uh, tropical, saltwater primarily, right? Or you have uh, both? Saltwater and fresh. Both. Go see Mike. He'll help you out. Bring him to church again. Hey, Mike, thank you so much for bringing our fish. You're welcome. He likes chili, too, and I told him we have a potluck of chili afterwards. <laughs> Thanks, brother. I appreciate right, you. you. So maybe, maybe Nemo will, uh, will get active here in a little bit. But let's talk about his story. Finding Nemo is my favorite movie of all time. It's one of the only clean movies out there. But here's the story. Nemo, he's this little clownfish, and he's born on a reef, and he's an only child. See, he had lots of other little brothers and sisters, but they all died when this barracuda... This big, this big fish came and attacked the family, killed the mother, and killed all those babies. And so little Nemo with his shriveled up fin, he's all alone, but he's happy. You can see he's a happy guy. He's a happy guy. Aren't you happy? Yeah. And Marlon, his dad, who was a very overprotective parent, wouldn't let Nemo do anything. He said, stay on the reef, buddy. Don't go anywhere out. Just, just stay at home. Just be comfortable with where you're at. You don't need to change anything. Just be very comfortable here. Well, one day during school, you know this story, one day during school, Nemo is captured to take to a fish store, not Aqua Imagination. They didn't have any. You didn't have any Nemo's there. Yeah. To be a pet for this dentist. Well, Marlin is panicked. His only son is gone. And so he he swims as fast and as far as he can go. And he he bumps into a blue tang fish named, what's her name? Dory. Dory. Dory, who has the, she's kind of obnoxious and she has a habit of frequently forgetting. And the two of them go against the entire ocean as they try to find their long lost Nemo. And after hours and hours and hours of searching and swimming to find Nemo, Marlin is about to give up. He says, I can't do it. I can't find him. I, the, the task, the calling that is out in front of me, I can't reach it. I can't match this. There's no way I can make it. And that's when Dory says these words. Hey, Mr. Grumpy Gills. When life gets you down, you know what you gotta do? I don't wanna know what you gotta do. Just keep swimming, just keep swimming, just keep swimming, swimming, swimming. Just keep swimming, just keep swimming. (laughs) This morning's message is a special message from Jesus. Just like Dory, as she says, just keep swimming. Turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2, where we've been the last several weeks. Revelation chapter 2, this is the last letter to a church in chapter 2. The next time we get together, it'll be chapter 3, but this is the one to Thyatira. Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 18. And while you're turning there, make sure you've got a Bible. Look down your row, make sure everybody's got one, something to look at. Just look next to you, make sure somebody, share with somebody if you need to. Make sure you can see these. I don't put them on the screen because I want you to see them for yourself. Make sure you, the people can see it. But let me give you a little context about Thyatira. Thyatira is an interesting city. This letter to them is the longest one of all the seven letters, but Thyatira is one of the smallest cities of all of them. Thank you, Eileen. Good job. So, so um, it's one of the smallest letters, and Thyatira was a, or one of the biggest letters, smallest towns. It was a town that was definitely deeply involved in pagan rituals and, and different gods and different things, but 
it wasn't under the emperor's rule and like this intense um, pressure to worship the emperor. It was different than like Ephesus and Smyrna and all the other different churches, but they, still had, they were still struggling with it. Thyatira was an industrial town. Did you know that Buford used to be a tannery, an industrial town, making leather? Thyatira was an industrial town, but they didn't make leather. They made dye, a reddish, purplish dye from the madder root. It grew all around the city, and they'd take this root, and they'd press it or whatever they did to make this dye where they could change the color of clothing and different garments and cloth. In fact, Lydia, maybe you've heard her name in the Bible. Lydia, she was the seller of, seller of purple, a red, a purple. She was one of the first converts in Philippi, and she came from Thyatira. It's an industrial town. And uh, these Christians, they're living there, and they're not quite as oppressed as all the other cities that we've talked about, but they're still in the midst of pagan life. Here is what it says in verse 18. Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. My words are read in my Bible, which means that, what is it? Jesus is talking to us. What better words can you have? And here's what Jesus says in verse 18. To the angel or the messenger, to the, to the pastor of the church in Thyatira, write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. The description of Jesus is, is a powerful one. It's not a, a connecting one as far as like, hey, I, I, I've been human too, I know what you've gone through. He says, I'm the Son of God. It's almost like he's name dropping. He's like, y'all, guess what? My dad is God the Father. That's pretty powerful. He's not, I, I'm not the human Jesus. I'm the Son of God. And it says, whose eyes are like blazing fire, like almost like a divine twinkle. Blazing fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. This blazing fire concept. Ranko Stefanovic, he says in his book, The Revelation of Jesus Christ, he says, the flaming eyes symbolize Christ's penetrating ability to see the innermost part of a human being. That's Jesus. He can see right into my heart. He, he can see my motives and why I do things. He can see my feelings and my thoughts. He knows what's going on inside. It's these, these blazing eyes of fire, they, they penetrate right to the inner parts of you. He knows. He can see my sin too. But I don't think that Jesus is the kind of God that, that stands on the outside of a fishbowl and just stares at us and watches as we bump into the walls of life and have to turn around and go the other way. I don't think He's waiting and, and pointing with beady little eyes waiting for us to mess up or sin. I think Jesus with these burning eyes searches our hearts and our souls and, and, and He wants us to see us like He sees us. Like if we could just see our sin and see the repentance and turn around and go the other way, that those blazing eyes of fire, they, they cauterize those hurts and those wounds. They seal up the hurts and the pain from sin. His blazing eyes of fire. If we could see ourselves through His eyes, those loving, twinkling eyes. And He, he describes Himself with feet that are burnished bronze, that are solid, Jesus doesn't ever change. He doesn't ever adjust. He doesn't compromise. He's, he never wobbles. He's the same yesterday. He's the same today. And He's the same forever. Oh, He's a rock that you can plant your feet on when you're falling. He's a strong arm when you're struggling that you can lean on. You can always count on Him. He's always there. He's always helping and so his description is the Son of God, the one that has a blazing fire in his eyes, whose feet are like burnished bras. Verse, verse 19 talks about the praise. You remember, if you've been here the last couple of weeks, the, the way that these verses, these letters are laid out. There's praise to the church. There's a rebuke which says, hey, here's something you need to work on. There's instruction where Jesus says, here's how you can do it. And there's the reward. So here's the praise. Here's what Jesus says to the church in Thyatira. Verse 19, I know your deeds your love and your faith, your service and your perseverance, and that you're doing more than you did at first. He says, way to go, church. Way to go, church in Thyatira. I see what you're doing. You, you are a beautiful church. You're growing. You're active. You're busy serving others. You're doing ministry and outreach. 
Lots of things are happening in your church. Your attendance is growing. Your membership is steadily increasing. You're having to double the size of your sanctuary. You're a friendly church that has lots of love. You have strong faith and belief in Jesus. That's the core of everything. You're persevering. And you're doing more and more every year. Way to go, church. Sound familiar? Amen. But there's a rebuke. There's a rebuke here too. And here's what Jesus says in verse 20. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. Jezebel. I've heard that name before. Is this the same Jezebel from the Old Testament way back in here? The one that was married to Ahab? The one that was a a tyrant? Is that the same Jezebel? Well, it can't be because the Bible clearly talks about her dying. So who is this Jezebel? Scholars will definitely say that it's not the same Jezebel, but this Jezebel in the church in Thyatira, where we're talking about here, that she, her actions were that just like the Jezebel of the old time. She acted like her. Or you might say that, Jezebel of a woman. Kind of a scary thing to hear. But she was acting like Jezebel. She was leading the people astray. And here's what she was doing. That Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. Verse 20, she says, or Jesus says, By her teaching she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. See, here's what she was doing. She believed that it was okay to try sin and try all kinds of sin, different areas, different things that God doesn't want you to do, in order to know what you shouldn't do. It doesn't make too much sense. Try the things you're not supposed to do so you know what not to do. This was her, her little compromise that she said, Loosen up, guys in, in Thyatira. Don't be so uptight. Just try a few things and you can understand what you aren't supposed to do. You can understand it better. Just like Jezebel of the Old Testament, who was a tyrant who took all the power of the country, and she said, hey, I'm going to slip a little thing in here, here too. In fact, they're my gods, my idols, my gods. And in fact, I want to kill all of your prophets. Kill them all. I don't want anybody standing for what's right. And I'm just going to slip in my religion and my, my idols into your life so that you can follow them. And it worked. She led the entire country astray. And just like the Jezebel of old, this new Jezebel was doing it as again. And, he, and here's, a, here's another piece to the puzzle. Thyatira, being an industrial town, had trade guilds, kind of like trade unions. We have some of those. In fact, the, the Volkswagen plant up in Chattanooga. You know that Volkswagen plant up there? Yeah, they just said, no, we don't want trade unions in here. We don't want trade guilds. But Thyatira had them. You had to be a part of them part of one, in order to succeed in society and financially in your business. And there was only one problem. These trade guilds were, would all come together and they would all eat together, common meals. And it would start and it would close with a sacrifice to one of these pagan idols. And so that people would bring their animals and they would make this sacrifice and maybe they'd take the head and they'd burn it and then they'd take a piece and they'd give it to a priest and then they'd have the rest of this animal and they would feast with it. This animal offered to an idol, uh, you're kind of paying homage to this being, this person, this statue, and then you come back and you eat this food. Can Christians be a part of that? Especially when all throughout the Bible God's talked about, stay away from it, don't be a part of it, don't eat food sacrificed to idols. One common belief among Christians was that these evil spirits, these demons, want to get inside of you any way they can. And if they can be a part of a sacrifice to someone other than the God of heaven, and you eat it, then they're inside of you, then they control you. And so these Christians are in a dilemma. Do I, do I go with society and culture and business and in industry and my business survive? Or do I stay strong to the calling that God has given me, a calling to be a different person, a different group of people? What do I do? The second piece of the puzzle was simply that at these common meals there was lots of drinking. And as they would drink, they would get drunk. And that would lead them into all sorts of sexual immorality with the, with the temple prostitutes and those that were around them. They would be drunk. Could Christians be a part of this? Jezebel was leading them astray. 
And here's what Jesus says in verse 21 as he continues the rebuke section. He says this, and listen to the grace in Jesus' voice. Listen to the mercy that he has to this Jezebel of a woman. Here's what he says in verse 21. He says, I have given her time to repent of her immorality. He says, I've given her chance after chance. I could give her more chances and just continue giving her opportunities. I want to save this woman. It's all about salvation, and I want to save her. He says, I've given her time to repent, but she's unwilling. And so here's the result of sin, the wages of sin. The wages of sin is death. And here in verse 22, this is what Jesus says, So, because of judgment, I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of their ways. See, he's calling out. He's like, I've got grace for anybody that wants it. It's just there. I want to give it to you. And in verse 23, he says, I will strike her children, uh, more like her followers, those that do this with her, dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. The wages of sin is death. And verse 24 starts his instruction. And I like this part. Let's focus right here. Verse 24. A lot of reading today. It's a long letter. Verse 24 says this. This is Jesus giving his instructions. He says, Now I say to the rest of you, the rest of you in Thyatira, who's that? The ones that hadn't been involved with this Jezebel woman. The one that hadn't followed her teachings. The one that hadn't been a part of this sexual immorality and this, this offering of food to idols. And he even says it there. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, that's the part right there where experiment, try everything you can and learn Satan's secrets so that you don't have to fall into those traps again. He says, I will not impose any burden on you except this, verse 25, and this is what, this is what Kendall read, only hold on to what you have till I come. Hold fast till I come. Just Keep swimming. Hold fast till I come. In a world of pagan rituals, where Thyatira is, God was calling them to stand up for who He wanted them to be. To live for this calling that He gave them. To be different. To remain faithful. In fact, I find it interesting that the last three weeks, it's been the same message to the people in Smyrna, do you remember what he said? Remain faithful. To the people in, in, what was last week? Pergamum. He said, don't compromise. And today he says the same thing again. Hold fast till I come. Just keep swimming. I find it interesting that, that Jesus, he gives us this call, a calling to be different to be a special people, Christians, who live and people should see us and see Jesus and want that. He gives this call to all Christians anywhere. It's in 1 Peter, and you know this. He says, you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation, God's special possession. Isn't that a great idea? His favorite thing ever. It could be a car. It could be a house. It could be anything. It could be a fish. No, he says, you, my chosen people, you're my special possession. You're my favorite one, the one I love the most. You're my special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. He's like, look, you have a calling to be special, to be different. I'm calling you to do this. He says, you in Thyatira, you in Buford, hold on to what you know is good. Hold on to what you know is true and righteous and just and honorable. Hold on to those things. Even if they're little things, hold on to them until I come. Just keep swimming. And today, this morning, here in this sanctuary, there are a lot of different stories. In every chair, there's a different journey happening. You're in a different place in your journey. You understand things from a different perspective than the person sitting next to you. There are different people with the different experiences, with different issues, with different sins. Each one of us is on a different path, a different journey to understand what God wants for us and His will for our life. There are people here today that at one point or another have made a decision to step away from God and church and Christianity altogether, but are back. There are those that right now have, are making a decision to keep one foot in society 
and one foot in Jesus. Finding a balance like that, and I don't even know if you can find a good balance like that. It's a decision that somebody may be making this morning. There are people who um, have allowed society, and I think most of us, have allowed society to skew our, our vision of the cross where our focus is drifting a little bit, where instead of looking straight at Jesus and what he's done for us, we tend to drift away a little bit because of different things that come into our lives, society, culture, your, your work, who you're with, different things like that. And maybe there are some here this morning that think this. Stay with me here on this. If something is not a salvation issue, maybe it's not important either. I wonder if there are some people here that think that. If it's not a salvation issue, maybe it doesn't matter either. And what about grace? Because if the little things do matter, then where does grace fit in there? Because if I have Jesus and He's given His life for me, and that is the most incredible message in the whole Bible, amen? In fact, that's what, that's what this whole book is about. It's about that one day when Jesus died for your sins and my sins. He, he died for you. That's incredible. For my past sins, for my present sins, for my future ones, He died for all of it. He didn't even, I, I didn't even, I wasn't even born yet. And He decided that I was worth His life for me. That's incredible. But what about this calling that He's given each one of us? To be different to stand apart, to be lifted up so that when people see us, they see the cross. This calling that's important. Because it's obvious that the message in here, grace is in there, as Jesus says, hey, I want to save everybody. But the the message that he says right here in verse 25 is hold on to what you know until I come. Hold fast till I come. Don't listen to Jezebel as she whispers in your ear. Listen to me. And I wonder if Jezebel whispers some of these things to you. For some, these aren't going to even apply to you at all. You may not even have even thought about this ever. You may not have ever even been in a Christian church before in your life, and this may be foreign to you. But for some of you, this may really apply to you. The little things, this calling that God's given. Because sometimes Jezebel Jezebel may whisper in your ear, Hey, it's no big deal. It's not a salvation issue if when you're out with your peers, your friends, and everybody else is trying wine coolers and just grabbing a couple of beers, it's no big deal. It's not a salvation issue. And Jesus says, hold on to what you know is good and true and pure. Hold on to that calling I've given you to stand up and stand outright and be a witness to me. Just keep swimming. I wonder if Jezebel says this in your ears. It's no big deal if, you're, if you don't care about church and, and Sabbath and this beautiful and, and this day. It doesn't matter. It's not an important piece of anything. Who cares when, when you could be at a Braves game or where you could you got free movie tickets. Skip church and, and the fellowship and, the, and the, the, the community here. Just. Do whatever. It's not a salvation issue. You're not going to go to heaven if, you're, if you have weekly attendance. And Jesus says, hold fast to what you know that I've given you as a special day to worship me, to spend time with me. Keep it holy. Hold fast till I come. Just keep swimming. I wonder if Jezebel says this one. It's tax time, and it's not a salvation issue, and it's not even that big deal, and nobody will ever know if you just have that list of deductions that aren't really deductions, but you're going to call them that, slip them in. Because look at at what the government does with your money anyway. What kind of an investment, Kelly? This is your point as well. It's no big deal. It's not a salvation issue. And Jesus says, hold on to what you know is honest and true. Hold fast till I come. Just keep swimming. Am I stepping on toes this morning? Don't don't say amen. (laughs) It's okay. Let's, I feel like Jesus is saying this. Maybe Jezebel says this. We only have a couple more. Don't stress out. I know you're sweating. It's okay. Jezebel says this. You know that cute young blonde that you end up bumping into occasionally at 
school or or work. School meaning you're already married. <laughs> you're you're in you're in uh, you're in your master's classes at school or, or at work or you happen to schedule your conferences so you're at the same place or you just happen to uh, know when they go to the coffee machine in the morning. It's okay to do a little harmless flirting, although you're married. It's not a salvation issue to flirt. And Jesus says, hold on to what you know is pure. Just keep swimming. Jezebel says this, you know how much fun it is to be critical of others? and point out their flaws. They're so easy. It's right there. They're just, people are flawed. It's not a salvation issue to gossip. Just go ahead. It's no big deal. And Jesus says, look at how, uh, Jesus says, hold fast to what you know is good and uplifting. Hold fast till I come. Just keep swimming. Jezebel says this, and maybe this is to uh, some of the younger people in here. Look 